Thank you for joining me today. Today we'll be talking about transformational leadership in Africa. How African millennials can create social, economic, and political transformation. And if you were just meeting for the first time, well, my name is Ni Adorati from Encourager Media. And on this channel, uh, we like to have conversations around faith, around spirituality, around culture, and also about how to live a successful life. And so, hey, leave a comment, click the subscribe button and click the like button. And also let me know where are you watching from right now? I'm excited about today because I'm going to be having a conversation about a topic that really, really resonates with me as a Nigerian and someone from African origin. I have a passion to see um, Africa transformed. I really believe that Africa has a unique, powerful place to occupy in the world. And so today, the topic that we're talking about is something that I am looking forward to, transformational leadership in Africa. Our African millennials can create social, economical, and political change. Wow, what a topic. That is awesome. And I have an incredible guest with me today uh, who is going to be just an incredible, amazing man. I've gotten to know him many years ago and kind of followed him. And I love to follow his comment, especially his commentary on social issues and his ideas and wisdom around topical issues that affect both African countries and Africa as a continent. And so I'm excited that he said um, yes today. Oh, by the way, hey, thank you for joining us. Hey, cousin, thank you for jumping in today. Hey, let me know in the comment, where are you watching from? Leave a comment. Let me know where in the world you're watching from right now as we jump in. And my, my wife is joining me. Thanks, and thanks, Bay, for joining live. All right, so let me introduce you to my guest today. So my guest today, joining me today, is Dr. Dotun Reju. Dr. Dotun Reju is the founder and chief resource person of the Center for Transformational Leadership that is based in Joss City, Nigeria. He's also the founding pastor of Kingdom Citizens Pavilion in Joss, Nigeria. And what I love about their community is that they focus on serving the city in areas of education, social political activism, and also economic empowerment. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Sociology from University of Lagos, a Master of Heart in Christian Leadership. He has a Doctor of Ministry in Transformational Leadership from a global, for the Global City from Bach Graduate University in Dallas, Texas, United States. He's also an adjunct faculty member of the Fres Fresno Pacific University um, based in Fresno, California, and also Daystar University based in Nairobi, Kenya, among other things. And he currently serves on the board of regents of Bach Graduate University and has been stewarding the Theology of Work Grant Program, which is an incredible program. You should check out, by the way, in his, on his website uh, for the U.S.-based Mustard Seed Foundation since 2008. This is an incredible man full of so much wisdom. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Dr. Datu Reju. Hello, sir. Good morning or good evening. Yeah, good evening from here in Joss. And good to see you, Ni. Nee, and um, thank you very much for having me. I'm so oh, delighted to be here. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I'm so excited about today and about what we're talking about. I know it's something that you're very, very passionate about. It's something you've yep. talked about for many years. And I feel like it's time for us to keep talking about this. Well, thank you, everyone who's joining us um, live and a hey, Click the like button and subscribe on our YouTube channel. We have conversations like this every week. And also tell me where you are watching from so I can shout you out as we um, have this conversation. Well, I'm going to jump in because we have so much to talk about and we have so little time. So Dr. Okay. Do Dr. Dr. let's start with what is transformational leadership? What does that really mean? Mm. Thanks a lot, Nia. That's a good question because many times we we just talk about transformation, transformation, and um, we've not really given it a deep thought to actually do like a description or a definition. I'm a mm -hmm. sociologist, so I love to define. Uh, now, transformation is from two words. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you look at that word, trans and form. 
And trans is where you get also the word for transport, which signifies a movement, uh-huh. a shift, uh-huh. you know, a relocation. And then the word form, which is shape, structure. So it's actually a movement uh-huh. into a new form, into a new structure, into a new reality. I mean, if you did biology, you know what that word is, metamorphosis. That's where mm-hmm. we get the word from, metamorpho, where, where you, you, you discover that at the end of the whole process, where, you know, the whole journey started from and where it's ending doesn't look anything alike. Mm-hmm. If you look at the butterfly, if you look at the egg and the full-blown butterfly, if they tell you that the, the egg is what became the butterfly, you will never be, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't connect. So transformation is, when it does happen, it doesn't look in any way like where it's coming from. So it's basically bigger, more profound than change. Uh-huh. Change is, if I suddenly become the host of this program and you become the guest, that's change. Uh-huh. But you are still me, I'm still dot. Uh-huh. That's change. But transformation is, is a total overhaul where the end of the whole process doesn't in any way look like you know the way it started mm, wow i love yeah. that i love when you use the word metamorphosis the beginning yes, and the yes. end has to look different it doesn't start um, the same and so in the in the context of in the context of Africa, we're, we're talking about Africa as as a continent and as a society, as a culture, right now. Yeah. What does how does that connect to Africans as far as transformation and transformational leadership? Yeah, uh, that is very that is very interesting. That I mean, it's so profound that we need to look at that because if we take that description that I just made, where mm. it started from, so our history is still affecting to a very large extent our current realities. So first of all, if we are talking about transformation in Africa, we need to look at a situation where we can truly say we have been holistically, transformationally decolonized. Uh, you know, that's that's the thing. But today we still talk about neocolonialism. You know, so we are still largely colonized. I have uh, to be careful the statement I make as an African, because if I say something that will make Britain angry, that will make America angry, they might deny me some grants. Mm. So I still have to play their cards. Mm. So we're still largely, we might no longer be politically colonized, but we're still socially colonized. We're still economically colonized. We still, you know, here we are, you and I, we still speak in English, nothing bad with that, but we can use the history to inform a new reality, but definitely we must not be victims of our history. But largely, Africa, if we want to look at it on a realistic basis, we're still a colony of the West. Wow. And that's where leadership really needs to start from. That is the proper diagnosis that we need to do. Many times we still live in denial. You, you know the story that came out to, you know, of recent where, you know, Mrs. Ngozi Okonjo Wela. Mm. was about becoming the DG of WTO, mm. you know, and suddenly, you know, America pulled the plug and they said they are not supporting and the whole process broke down. Wow. The question I ask myself is this, where is African trade organization? Where is mm. African trade organization? So we, we don't, up to this moment, we don't have a say. We are still not in charge of our destinies because we are still tied to the apron strings of colonial masters. So that's where leadership kicks in. The leadership we've had over the years since independence has been a leadership of change, not Mm. a leadership of transformation. You know, so we're still acting out an old script. The police force, our economy, our currency, we're still not in charge of anything. You know, if I, you know, if I have Naira in my pocket as a Nigerian, if you have shillings in your pocket as a Kenyan, you still have to denominate it in the dollar. That's, that, that's not how to be a nation. It takes a transformational leader and transformational leadership value system to be able to make that shift. We have changed. We are no longer colonized, but we have not transformed. Wow. Wow, that, that gives me a lot to <laughs> to think about. And I mean, I have yeah. questions, but before I go into some of my questions, 
um, as you're talking, I'm looking, I'm thinking through um, some of the history of different African, I don't know all the history of all African countries. I know some of us, some countries were colonized by the British, some by the mm -hmm. French, some by the Portuguese. Yeah. Uh, it is depending yeah. on what and um, Arab nations in the North, depending on where in Africa you, you are in. And yeah. um, um, I, I look at the, the closest ones that I can remember, at least right now, I look at South Africa, I look at Nigeria and I look at Ghana because those are yeah. probably the most big popular ones and several other ones. Yeah. And um, I look at South Africa, for example. I mean, South Africa went through um, and a very interesting time in their history that was, you know, just very brutal. And and then finally, um, Thango Mandela came in, became the president, and he started this process of, I, I feel like he started a process of transformation, of leading a country from um slavery and just that mentality into giving them an identity of this is who you are as south africans yeah and um but if we look at south africa uh, but between then and now we've seen so many things um xenophobia um you know and just so many of that stuff i mean i don't know if there's been a major change as far as poverty i, I look at nigeria as another example of we finally got our independence in 1960 which is awesome we celebrate that but it, it kind of feels like we're still stuck. Some uh, we're not able to move forward, and maybe Ghana has made more progress, in my opinion, than we have in Nigeria. I feel like Ghana has made some leap forward. Um, I'm not very familiar with um, other countries, but what what do you think happens? Why do we start a process? It looks like we start a process of transformation, and then somehow we get we just get stuck and it's almost it's like we can't move forward. What is the problem with African countries that prevents us from actually stepping into full transformation? Great question. Um, I'll look at South Africa, you know, because it's more recent. Mm. You know, if you look at South Africa, because of apartheid, the long years of apartheid, um, mm. we, we saw an upsurge in activism, mm. you know, in activism, which eventually led to you know the liberation of the country but you see when you do leadership studies there's a massive difference between activism and leadership the reason you've not been able to see any meaningful transformation mandela is such a wise man because he he understands this concept of activism being different from leadership mm. activism can liberate you from slavery but it can't take you into freedom mm. yeah because freedom is from two words, the liberty to be able to exercise dominion, to mm. be able to take charge of your own destiny. Now, Mandela understood that, and he was he did one term, handed over to Thabo Mbeki, who is one of his protégés, mm. that he advised to go prepare themselves, that apartheid will one day come to an end, and they will no longer have need for activists, but they will need leaders. They will need technocrats. They will need administrators. They will need people who can systemize. And that's, that's why you see that when, when, when Mandela left the scene, Thabo Mbeki came in and there was a jump. There was an oomph. There was a bit of an acceleration. Mm. But eventually what has happened is that there's been a reversal where activists have come to take over again. Mm. And you see things because... Activists don't know when activism stops. Wow. Even when they get into leadership and into governance, they still continue to fight. Hmm. <laughs> they still continue to fight. And that's hmm. why you see, because they, they constantly live with that slavish mentality, that orientation that someone is coming to take what belongs to them. That's why you see the xenophobic you know, attack. They were killing hmm. Nigerians, killing Zimbabweans, forgetting history that these are the same guys who fought right for their mm. independence wow you know and, and it's not that the zimbabweans are coming to us for a payback they're very enterprising people nigerians are not coming to have I, i'm not saying these nations are perfect mm. for nigeria we've not had you know because this is where i live we've not had a correct interpretation of history mm. you know that we got independent we have to know that that was a blueprint when we got independent for nigeria i can speak directly to that Mm. Nigeria, if maybe maybe I should say on a general level, but maybe I'll come back to that if if there's mm. any question that comes, you know, maybe in that light. Now, Nigeria wouldn't have a good interpretation of history because those who fought for our independence 
or those we believe fought for our independence, they are not the ones who really fought for our independence. Mm. They're not. There is a particular documentary that is currently streaming on Netflix. That is by, by you know, by Shukbo Shashore. Mm. You know, I think I referred it to you in, in, in one of my blogs. Mm. I don't know what it's called now. When it came the out journey, originally, what, the journey of an yeah, African colony. Yeah, absolutely. When you watch that series, Shukbo pointed out that that the, the those who really fought for independence were the activists of maybe the the tin miners in Enugun. Mm -hmm. the Abba women riots and all those kind of things. The people we know as the political game changers, the Amandu Bello, the Aulawa, the Zik, they basically, according to Shukba, and I agree, they replaced the colonial masters. They mm -hmm. basically just took, they, they took the position of the colonial masters. And that's why today where we still sit, you discover that they are still kind of masters we we leave the road for them when they drive mm. we call we, you can't call them you know by name i remember a very good you know younger friend of mine who is very close to the current vice president of nigeria we, you know who i'm very close to too when he became vice president we could no longer call him by his name we have to put he his excellency so mm. <clears throat> the same culture that made us call lugard lord lugard is the same that's making us call our president his excellency and by the time you mention the name you have to add something in the at the end o o n g c f r and all mm -hmm. those kind of things so we and that is the basic problem and then secondly when nigeria got independent it was recognized that it was a nation of nations mm. i still remember in the high school when i when i was in high school the western region had a consulate office in london the eastern region has a consulate in london wow. yeah i didn't know that but it, yeah it, but it got to a point where everybody has to go to abuja we mm -hmm. are up to this moment we are not a federation mm -hmm. nigeria is a country is not a nation is mm -hmm. a nation of nations the Igbo man is so profoundly different from a Hausa man. You can't govern them the same way. The Yoruba man by culture, by value, but is totally different from an Igbo man. These are nations that we try to force into a marriage. Nigeria's problem can be traced back to 1914 when the Northern and the Southern Protectorate were amalgamated. Mm. Until we go back there, and really recognize and you know when people talk about that is as if we want to divide the country no mm. we are not dividing the country we want a situation where the country is structured governed you know in a way that is consistent with its identity mm. that's the problem because there is no way how some man can govern you see by leadership principle you can't govern people you don't know. And you can't you can lead people you don't know. You can't lead people you don't love. You can't lead people you don't know. Leadership must be contextual. Right now, leadership is far from the people. Somebody sneezes in one village in Ogun State, is blaming the president in Abuja. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something happens in River State. Nobody talks about the governor until the most relevant leader or the structure of the government is a local government chairman we will not we, we, we won't go far huh. we will not go far because that's when we can even practice democracy in a way that reflects us because that's another topic for another day huh. africa with the current western variant of democracy we can never develop wow we can never develop uh. <laughs> oh my god yeah i mean and that i was thinking about this i, I had a conversation with um in some of my past um live streams we, we, we do especially during the end sars protest during the thick of the end SARS protest i had conversations with one of my uh friends and then with and somebody else and we're kind of some of the things you talked about are some of the things we also kind of talked about as far as 
going back to history first thing that was frustrating for me personally was the first time i watched that documentary the journey of an african colony and finding yeah. out that i actually do not know the history of my country where i'm from Absolutely. because what i was Absolutely. taught in school and what i'm watching is totally different and that is it's shocking totally and it, and it, it, it kind of feels like sometimes it depends on who writes the history of these countries like um it's very very possible that for most african countries that were colonized by whatever person they were colonized um, by the history of that country was rewritten by the masters to reflect their own beliefs and values and after the Absolutely. leave unless that country is intentional about going back to revisit their own history and reestablish. And I feel like there are some African countries who are intentional about doing that and went back to yeah. reestablish themselves, either by changing their name to the name yeah. they chose for themselves, reestablishing their yeah. own values. And then there are some that kind of just moved on and didn't really stop to think that through. And Rwanda and, has done that. Mm, yeah, yeah, Rwanda. And that they, they've gone back, their, their economy, in fact, they are one of the early standards. They launched a, an initiative they called the Homegrown Solution, oh. HGS. And they looked at their, maybe one iconic part of it was their legal system. Oh. And that was what they used to actually wipe off the memories of the genocide. You know, that their legal system by, by tradition, when there is a crime committed or maybe there is maybe like an altercation between they don't you don't go to court so that you are sent to jail mm. you, you go to court to settle to reconcile and mm -hmm. that's what they've gone back to that's what they've mm -hmm. gone back to that's why their own truth and reconciliation committee worked it didn't work so well in south africa it didn't work when we had the Oputa panel in nigeria mm -hmm. because it was all western wow right it was western but for the rwandan they gave they went back right now you know there, there are many other things you're very right a lot of african countries need to go back and it's not only africa you're having problems with african americans in the you know in the united states you know it's because of history many of them don't know the history mm. you know they don't know the history they they suddenly just sort of jump into it in the middle right they don't mm. know the history so if you don't know where you where you are at, right, or where you were, you won't understand where you are at, and there's no way you can journey forward to where you need to be. So these are realities, and millennials need to know that they have a sense. Because like you just said, you didn't know the history until you watched that documentary. Mm -hmm. You are a millennial. You need to go back mm -hmm. and check it. This is where I came from. This is the, and then that's where you can that's where you can strategize. Because look at our police. Our police has never been restructured since independence. I'm talking about Nigeria. Mm. The value system that set up the police was colonial. The purpose of the police was to subdue the colonized. Mm. It, was meant, it wasn't meant to serve them. The only thing we've done is to change it from you know, royal police to Nigerian police. The value mm. system remains the same. So you, you live in the United States. If you see a policeman, maybe... You know, when I used to visit very regularly when I was doing my doctorate, mm -hmm. when you see a policeman around, you're kind of calm. It's not like that in Nigeria. When you see a policeman, that's where you're nervous. Mm. That's where you're nervous. Because the policeman is your boss. Mm. You know, here. Yeah, he's your boss. He talks, to, he talks down at you. You have to be mm. careful, you know. And mm. the man is already weaponized because he's... There is no welfare system so that he can be angry at, you know, at citizens. You know, it's a long story. We have not made the Nigerian police, the Nigerian police that serves. We've just changed narratives. Police is mm -hmm. your friend. Remove the force and just make it Nigerian police. Those things don't, you know, they don't change anything. The value system, the ethos need to, need to be transformed. Wow. So good, Pastor Dad. I, I wanted to go to, um, I, I remember you wrote this. Um, oh, really? Okay. Ago, and I read this yeah. and I was like, oh my God, there's so much um, truth. I'm going to just pick through some lines that I wanted you to just speak into. You, you've kind of already spoken to this a little bit. Activists yeah. are not necessarily good leaders, which was really, yeah. really good. That stood out for me. 
Um, I want to talk about this, but before that, I wanted to talk about this first. Westernization is not the same as globalization. We need African, yeah. we need African and our African values to be present in the global space. I, I wanted you to yeah. kind of speak into that a little bit. What does that mean? What is Westernization? What is globalization? And how do we represent African values in a global stage? Yeah. Um there was there was an Indian doctor who was asked to define you know globalization. Mm. And he said globalization is the death of Diana, Princess wow. Diana. It's the Princess Diana, a princess mm. of you know of you of uh, Wales, you know, who had a boyfriend who is an Egyptian, had an accident in a German car, wow. you know, in the French tunnel, treated by American doctors using Brazilian medicines. Oh, wow. And he sort of put everything together. It was the most mm -hmm. profound, you know, definition of globalization I've ever had. But you see what we've done, what Africa has done. I'll give you a very good example to tell you that we are not an act because globalization is plug and play. Mm -hmm. Everybody. There's another book that I would, that I recommend. Maybe my professor thing is coming out now by Thomas Friedman. He, he, he wrote a book called The World is Flat. And he really spoke about globalization there. Now, it's plug and play. It's, it's what's making this possible for you and I to be able to do this. Mm. You know, you're right there in the United States. I'm here in Jaws. Now, but you discover that we're still playing the Western game. Africa is not an active player. Asia is becoming an active player, right? But Africa, we are not coming in there with our values. There's another book written by a Zambian lady, you know, Moyo Dambisa, Dead Aid. Mm. Africa is still living on aid. We still don't, wow. we are still not in charge of our, you know, resources, so to say. We got crude oil in Nigeria in the 50s, or, or yeah, or, or mm. that about 60 something. Shell is still the one bringing the crude from the, you know, from the ground, mm. right? The copper deposit in Zambia. If that's the only mineral resource we have in Africa, Africa will be a wealthy continent. How many Zambians have gone to school to study mining engineering? It's mm -hmm. still being done by the Chinese. So you discover that we, we are still, and then for our millennials, they've become more westernized than Africanized. Mm. Yeah, they have read, and that's why I said they need to first of all be de-westernized remind themselves that they are Africans. I'll give you an example. The movie that made so much, you know, unfortunately the, the lead actor passed not too long ago, yeah. Black Panther. Uh -huh. You see, when I watch movies, I don't watch movies. I interact with movies. Uh -huh. Someone gave me a ticket to go see that movie in London and I went, and by the time I came out and she asked me, how was it? Was it interesting? I said, why did the movie end in New York? <laughs> I'm not in that. I'm not in that distance. But I said, is that all you saw? No. I said, of course. This movie that is, is about joking. Africa. By the time I did, you know, I dug into the story, it wasn't an African that wrote the story. Somebody else is still telling our story. Hmm. That movie should have ended in Addis Ababa, which is the headquarters of AU, right? Hmm. <laughs> You know, why, with all the things, with our resources, we discover, why did the two brothers kill themselves? Why can't they make up? Mm. You see, these are the issues. Because movies shape us. They shape us. These are the, that, that's where we get our, we need to be de-westernized. I'm not saying don't go abroad to study. I'm not even saying don't live abroad. Mm. Historically speaking, most of the people that that did that did, you know that sort of delivered their countries lived abroad, even from mm. Bible days. Moses, Moses lived in Egypt before he could deliver Israel. Mm. You know, Nehemiah walked in Babylon before he could come back home and do so. But when you live abroad, and you know me, you know, I think I met you in London. Mm -hmm. When when we when you live abroad, I always tell you, you know, you need to know the reason why you're there. Mm. Maybe you are there to just see that things can work so that you can come back home and replicate the same thing. So it's it's not even where you live. Mm. Millennials need to be de-westernized. They need to be de-westernized because they are right now, they are not they are not proud of being Africans. 
it's only when they are, you know, in, in Nigeria now there's a whole among millennials, they all have a Canada project. They, they want to go and live in Canada. <laughs> now, this is what I tell them. This oh is what God. I tell them. Mm. If you go live in Canada, there's no problem. Even if you get a Canadian passport, no problem. But you will you will continue to be a stranger. Mm. And I said to you, I don't, I I pray that you don't get to a point where you are reminded that you are not a Canadian. Mm. You will be pained. Don't blame anyone for profiling you, for racially abusing you. Someone built Canada. You must build Africa. Mm. You must build Africa. So that's my that's my take. That's why I say, first of all, the first step in transforming Africa is that millennials need to be de-westernized, particularly. Someone is saying not just millennials. Millennials are about 65% of the population right now. I'm mm. 57. I'm Generation X. I'm not a millennial. But mm. in my mind, I believe I need the millennials for me to get to where I'm going. And mm. that's why my heart is with them. So I am I I have to I have to remind myself that I have a tribe in Nigeria. It's something I do deliberately. I have over the years educated myself. I pioneer a high school here in Jos. When you complete our application form, there's no state of origin. Uh. I don't put it there because state of origin has no bearing on the fact that you want to come and study physics. <laughs> it has no bearing. So why am I asking you for your state of origin? I don't like quota system. Mm. It promotes mediocrity. Yeah. Give everybody equal opportunities because everyone has their own strength. I hope I'm not over answering your questions. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> you're, you're dropping so many gems. One second. I forgot to plug in my laptop into the power and it's going down. So one second, everyone. Down. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, found it. All oh, right. There you are. Awesome. Found it. Yay. This is too good to lose power. I'm like, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, you know, ev everything you said speaks to me so much because I, I mean, I've, uh, if I use myself as an example, so I, I left, I left Nigeria 2009. First time I left Nigeria. I lived in London for four years and then moved to the US where I live now, where I've lived since 2013 for, mm. um, this is my seventh year. So I've been outside of the country for 11 years. I've only been back mm. for maybe two weeks in between 11 years. Mm. And I'll be honest, uh, at some point in my journey, I started to forget where I came from. I was just focused on um, what I want to do and the dreams I have. And then probably like maybe, two or maybe three years ago was kind of started to dawn on me like hey i i think i'm there's something missing and i don't know exactly what is missing but i can feel a void and i couldn't pinpoint until i realized the void is missing is i was starting to forget who i really was i was becoming right. so which i i love the western countries i love the i love london i i my, my heart is still lives in London. Part of me still lives there. I love living in the US. I'm thankful for this amazing country. Um, but at the same time, I, I just felt there was something missing. And what was missing was I was beginning to forget my identity as an African and as a Nigerian. When I started to reconnect to that and I started to listen to Nigerian songs again and memories of and food and all the memories of my childhood growing up and I, and and I started feeling emotional, like, oh my God, there, this is what is missing. This is the part of me that I forget. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, someone asked an amazing question. Thank you, thank you, Dami, for that question. I'm going to come to that in a second, but I wanted to jump back to that the Westernization, okay? Because I, because in your in your post on Facebook, that was one of the things you mentioned. But let me just show that because I was like, that that was such a good. Um, thing you wrote that line actually stood out for me I actually copied and pasted it because we, it was so powerful you said today's youth especially African millennials need to go beyond schooling to education the westernization to contextual literacy in social economic and political spheres the future of the world is not virtual this it is the establishment of new realities and I was like, wow, that is true. And I, want, I wanted to unpack that a little bit, especially that the Westernization. How do we, because 
the fact is that's just who we are right now. We are, yeah. um, which is good for us. Part of that is good for us because it opens our eyes to see the world on a different stage and how other countries work and inspires us to want to aspire to that. But how do we balance that playing on a global stage, learning from the West and the things they do well without losing our identity of who we are as Africans? How do we do that? Yeah, first of all, you have to understand that transformation takes time. Uh, and it takes a long time. And having said that, anyone who is involved, who want to get involved in the transformational process, the first thing you need to do is to understand the value of sacrifice, uh, the value of selflessness, that what I'm starting, I'm not going to be in charge of the process. Uh, and I don't want to own it. What I'm starting, I'm just going to be a part of a whole. I'm going to start something that somebody else might finish. But you see, that is totally not in tandem with Western values. The Western value is about ownership, mm. not about stewardship, mm. right? Until Africans come, first of all, to reorientate themselves that nobody is going to steal anything from you if you are not careless. Africa need to first of all overcome anger, blame game. It is because we were colonized. It is because of slavery. I have redefined slavery. I my take is it was slave trade. If it was an economic transaction, don't blame only the buyer. On also blame the seller. So everybody mm -hmm. has a blame, right? Everybody has you know. So Africa first of all need to overcome the blame game. Because we found a very good reason why we are the way we are. Hmm. And then another issue in Africa where we need to start from is one of the one major tool that was used to colonize Africa was Christianity and Islam. Hmm. For Christians, you need to first of all now come to understand which Christianity am I practicing? Which Islam am I practicing? Hmm. Is it a Christianity that was used to colonize me or the one from the Bible? Which Islam am I practicing? Is it the one that was used to, is it the result of the jihad which I was forced to? I met a cab driver in, you know, you know, in the UK who drove me to the airport. He's from Afghanistan. And he said the major war in Afghanistan is that they want to go back to the conversation they had with the Islamic jihadists. That why are you forcing us to accept Islam? That was when I discovered that. Afghanistan didn't even have a history of Islam. It was imposed mm. on them. It was a wow. tool of colonization. So these are the kind of things. Because, for example, in Nigeria, in Africa, so I just got back from Zambia. When we are supposed to work, we are praying. Prayer is one of the problems in Nigeria. <laughs> one of the reasons why Nigerians are poor, why they are fraudulent, is prayer. Mm. It's prayer. When they're supposed to be working, you... you you give to God what you should demand from your government. Wow. That's the point. So if, if on all those levels, then you go to education because I actually spoke about education there. We hmm. don't have education in Nigeria. We only go to school. Oof. Because if we're going to have education, we need to go back to rediscovering our language. I, hmm. I threw a joke here and I did the same in you know, in um, Zambia. I asked this, I said, what is crankshaft in Yoruba language? <laughs> I have no idea. And I said to this guy in Zambia, what is crankshaft in Bemba language or Tonga? We don't have, you know what that means? We can't teach science with African language. Wow. Somebody needs to take it as a doctoral dissertation. I supervise a doctoral student in my university, in Baki Garden University. He's from Ethiopia. His dissertation is that Ethiopia must not, you know, Ethiopia is the only African country that was never colonized. Mm. You know, Ethiopia is the only, they, now they are losing their language, which is the Amharic. Wow. So the dissertation of this guy is, he came up with a policy document that he was presenting to the government on how to preserve the Amharic language. Hmm. Because you can communicate Amharic, you can use Amharic to teach any science subject. I was wow. once on an Ethiopian airplane 
that was flying back to Nigeria and the plane developed a fault just before we took off. And the engineers came, nearly all of them were Ethiopians. Mm. Everyone, they are Ethiopians. So we need to be careful what's going on there now. Because mm. that is what normally happens when, 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 when problems are gonna happen in any kind of country, you know, we know and we start fighting ourselves. Mm. We need to be careful. Africa, now Africa is absent. Everybody is talking about UN. But you see, we're going to start that journey by faith, the Christianity. What we practice right now is not the, it's not the Christianity of the Bible. Mm. It's a colonial Christianity. Wow. The one that makes us want to go to heaven and they plunder all the mineral resources. That's not the Christianity. No, let me leave that because I don't like <laughs> di discussing theological issues on, you know, on this kind of, but it's one, one of the problems of Africa right now is that faith because mm. politicians use it to campaign mm. they use it to divide tribe right don't get a house a man to want to support a yoruba man it will never work it will result in fraud so this and you know if we're going to do this it's a long time mm. it's going to require what i call their contextual education why should anybody why should everybody want to go to, to the university there's no need. We don't all have to go to university. If we value, the reason you mentioned Ghana, Ghana is strong on vocational education. Mm. Yeah. That's why you study mechanical engineering and you take your car to a guy who doesn't even know how to pronounce shock absorber. You call him shock and suffer and the mechanical engineering <laughs> guy takes the car there. That's the point. You can't fix mm. your car because the education system in Nigeria, right, is to make us go and work in the civil service and push fires. It doesn't promote critical thinking. It does not make you entrepreneurial. You go and study masters in business administration and then you come out. The first thing you do with your MBA is to design a CV. <laughs> I'm looking for a job. <laughs> you see, these are the issues. Oh my God! Yeah, oh, man. these are the issues. So you can see it's a very long journey. It if is I can, you know, somebody is talking about you know electricity. If I can maintain the generator in my house, why can't we have regular power supply? Mm -hmm. It's still foreign, you know, foreign influence. These are the issues, Ni, and it's a long process. So in the way we're going to start shaping that new ideology. It goes down. I don't know how you raise your kids. Do you tell mm. them they are Nigerians? Do they speak the do they speak the dialect? Me, I'll give you an instance. I've I frequent, you know, London. There's something I always watch over, I mean, you know, observe when I'm in the train. You see Nigerians or Ghanaians family that speak in English. Mm. You see Indians that are speaking their dialect. Mm -hmm. You see Chinese, they are speaking their dialect. You know what's common to all of them? Those children were all born in London. Huh. But the Indians speak their dialect. Your children speak not just English, Queen's English. Oh. You are excited when they speak with a British accent. It gives you, it's colonialism. Oh. Yeah. These are the issues. You want another ideology? We need to we need to begin to craft new narratives. Do you know very few Indians back to the immigration issues in London? The richest nation on earth is Indian nation. Oh. Yeah. I can't begin to go into that because I don't want to compare. We're talking about transformation leadership in Africa. It's a long journey. And mm. it starts from, let us tell ourselves, we don't have a special problem. We only have a unique problem with a unique solution. How old is, you know, Joe Biden? Mm. How old is Joe Biden? 71? Yeah, probably in the 70s. Yeah, they are about. 70s. This guy has been in politics since he was in his 20s. Mm. Where are the young ones? Mm. Buhari is close to 80. Where are the young ones? It's like politicians are the same everywhere. I said that to let Africa know that we need to stop thinking we have a special problem. We have a unique problem 
with a unique solution. When we identify that problem for what it is, the strategy to actually start it, you know, to begin to correct it, we just fall on our laps. Uh. Right now we are using Western solutions, you know, to solve African problems. Uh. But it is the Western that created the problem. If the system we are using to correct something is the system that created it, we will never succeed. Wow. Oh, so good. This is so awesome and incredible. Wow. This is so good. I'm just thinking through everything you've said, trying to digest it. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, looking through some of the questions, and you've, you've answered some of them. Somebody yes, asked. I'm um, actually looking at them. Yeah. yeah said, you already answered this. Ideology. About, yeah, yeah. Ideology. Yeah. And then um, this it's is my education. Mic- education. Yeah. And um, this is my cousin, and he kind of referenced this a little bit, but he's talking about um, people who are born, for example, he's, he was born and raised in the UK. He wasn't born in mm-hmm. Nigeria, obviously. So um, thinking, how do you, um, one of the things I find, especially even living here in the US, I mean, the US is kind of different because obviously a lot of people were brought from um, Africa here, grew up, their, their ancestors grew up in slavery, um, but this is kind of like their home, but they still, they see that rescue let with you, identity crisis. Let me, tell your, let me tell your cousin a story, a quick story. Mm. I met a man a few years ago. Let me first of all acknowledge my friend who is on the call. Marlene mm. Hines is from is from uh, Jamaica. Jamaica. She's actually my colleague in Baki now. Now, he, he, you know, this man, I met him on a plane. He's actually the managing director of Gulfstream, this guy that sells private jets in Nigeria. Yeah. Mm. So I met him as an Indian and I said, oh, I've never been to India. And he said, I've never been to India. I said, really? He said, yes, I was born in Malawi, raised in London, and wow. I've lived in Kaduna for 30 years. Wow. He said, I've never been to India. This guy has Indian accent. Wow. I've been to Durban in South Africa. Durban in South Africa has the largest population of Indians outside of India. Hmm. There is nowhere you see an Indian. They have, I've met Indians in Malaysia. They have Indian accent. Huh. You see, nothing, the first thing you want to do with your children if you live abroad is language. Uh. There was a time in the history of mankind where the Hebrew language was extinct. It was one family that started speaking it again. And now it's a national language. You mm-hmm. don't want them. And it's, language is not just spoken, but culture. Mm-hmm. The whole the whole culture. So you can live outside of Africa, but you carry Africa everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. The Jews do it literally. They create their own community. They set mm-hmm. up their own schools. Can't you see that Russians have school in Nigeria? There's a mm-hmm. Turkish school in Nigeria. Is there an African school in London? Huh. Do you have an African school in the United States? Uh-huh. You don't have. You get sucked into the culture. These are the issues. It's not whether you live abroad or you were born abroad. This, this Indian guy told me something. He said, Indians everywhere in the world, they have an economic narrative. Don't spend what you have not earned. Uh-huh. So that's not just language. That's a value system. Yeah. It's culture. Look at London, all the corner shops in London that are owned by an Indian or a Pakistani. Uh-huh. Let me give you another bit of history. In the 60s, when India, I mean, India, you know, Africa started getting independent, they were migrating abroad. Uh-huh. They were following their money. Uh-huh. This is the economic prediction that came out. That when Indians get to London, they ask, what do they need? When Africans get there, they ask, what do they, what can I do? Mm. So the African end up doing many jobs. The Indian set up businesses. Wow. That's why today look at it. Lundies, cost cutters, huh. all those corner shops in, in the UK, they own it. Uh-huh. They own yeah. businesses. So I want to bring you back to, I want to bring, a, a, you know, like a cousin of mine to London. He's not coming to be looking to be praying in church for favor in the home office. He's coming as an investor and he gets and he gets a permanent stay. Mm. One of the predictions then was that an Indian is going to be the prime minister of Britain. 
at least the mayor now of London. Mm. In fact, he nearly happened, and it's just a matter of time. So, so these are the kind of things. It's, it's not where you live, and that's where the globalization and the westernization comes in. When you go to the West, you get sucked into it. You forget home. So it's it's so. Do we have African schools? If there's anything close to it, it's African food. I like it the way Nigerians mm. have colonized Peckham. I mean, the <laughs> Pakistani, the Pakistani there, the Pakistani there speaks Yoruba, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> but but <laughs> you see, these are realities, me, that mm. we have to be very intentional about. Transformational, you know, realities requires intention. They're saying the whole world is going virtual. Africa will be left behind. I'm using one corner of my eye now to look at my connections. I have about four different connections in this in my study here. Wow. Of internet. If you can, if you look behind me, there are all kind of wires there. Those are wow. inverter and those kind of things, so that I can have regular power. Wow. If that can work in my house, I call my home a local government. <laughs> yeah, because. I have my private water supply, private electricity, <laughs> private. So, <laughs> um, uh, my wife is the chairman of the local government. I'm the I'm the driver. I, you know. <laughs> so, oh it's my god, yeah. Hmm. Funny, but that that that's, that's the, the way reality. things are. Mm. That's the that's that's the reality. That's oh the reality. Mm. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Marlene said something that kind of echoes what yeah. you said. Um, I'm trying to pull it on the screen. It was powerful. And yeah. she was saying the Caribbean people, including the academics, look to Africa for leadership in connecting to our roots. But how can Africa lead if the people do not know who they are or appreciate their their culture? And that is so true. Yeah. That is so, so true. true. And I mean, yeah. it's uh, something I've been talking with my friends and we've all been talking about recently, which is um that when africa actually gets its act together like there's something the world is missing that yeah. only africa can actually reveal to the world and and it's like it's it's like time and time and time again um we try to rise up and we get we keep get pushing pushed down but the moment we finally rise up and we embrace ourselves and embrace the brilliance of who we are and and um, the history of where we've come from and what yeah. we have to offer the world, the world's going to be totally different. It's going to be a different yeah. place. Here's the way I put it, Nii. The world is working with a limp mm. because Africa is missing. Africa is missing. The world is working with a limp. Mm. You see, Africa needs to position herself that in a very strategic way, in a non-threatening way, with so much wisdom, Hmm. Because the, the the West, they are afraid of Africa. Look at what happened with the Windrush kind of news that came out of you know of, of Britain. The Caribbeans built London. They built Britain, and these are guys they came in trust, right? And then many of them never really tried to even you know legal, to become legal citizens. And after a while, you rush them back home. You see. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, you're always afraid that the owner will come for it. Mm. The West is afraid of Africa. So they don't want Africa to really come to it. So they belabor us with wars, with tribal conflicts and things like that. Mm. We, need, we need to come in such a way that if the 9 billion people on earth become billionaires, there will still be more than enough for another 9 billion to become billionaires and there will still be excesses. Mm. The whole world can live in Texas, and there will mm. still be land for farming. Wow. God that created this world, the, the, the value system of that creation is abundance. Mm. But people work in fear that I need to get what that person has so that I can use it to build mine. Africa needs to be strategic. That We are not going to be a threat to Europe, America. Mm. There's enough for everybody, mm. but it takes a leader who knows himself. But we still go cap in hand. We still go for the photo ops. We still, you know, we it's it's and and it's not going to because look at what Malin said. The Caribbeans need us because this mm. is where they come from. Mm. This is where they come from. But we are belabored with 
when Africans fight, who benefits? We don't manufacture guns. Uh. Somebody makes money. Yeah. Somebody uh. makes so Africa needs to first of all look inwards. Let's be selfish for a while. Let's respect our culture because selfishness doesn't really mean that you are cheating someone. Right? Uh. When everybody was shouting about Trump, I don't even want to mention that. When somebody was, you know, talking about, I, I said, how I wish I have a, you know, a Nigerian president who will say Nigeria first, uh, in a right sense. In a right if sense, you yeah. know the, if you know the kind of buzz about American election here, I said, what's your problem? What's your business with American election? We have a president. We don't even know whether he's here or not. He's sick. He has headache. He's going to Europe. Let's <laughs> look inwards, right? You are mm. joining your voices to fight gender equality and all those kind of things. Have you factored in your culture? Uh -huh. You know, have you factored in your culture? Do, do you understand African men walk their socks off to take care of their wives? Uh -huh. Yeah. There's no need for any gender, whatever. African men walk their heads off. That's the culture. If it turns on its head, we have been negatively influenced. Uh. You see, these are the things. And then Africans to join their voice, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, right? It does uh -huh. matter. Uh -huh. And if anybody needs to say that to anybody, Black people need to say it to themselves. Uh -huh. You remember what Fela did? Fela said that you can't dash me human right. Dash is a word in, you know, you know, in Nigeria, you know, it's uh -huh. gift. You know, for those watching who are not Nigerians, you can uh. give me human right. Human right is my property. It's my property. You can't give me what belongs to me. So if anybody is chanting Black Lives Matter, is directed at who? Uh. And nobody, no, you know, it should, we should tell ourselves that our lives matter. Uh. We can't demand it from anybody. You see, the narrative has to change. It has to change. It must change. Africa need to, because there's a whole narrative to me, I hope, maybe, maybe you don't know, that African-Americans, they've been taught to believe that Africans in Africa don't like them. Uh, which is actually yeah. not true. <laughs> which is not true. Wow. <laughs> which is not, and that's the story that played out in Black Panther. Uh, yeah. You see, wow. movies, movies shape minds. So I tell millennials, you know, that don't watch movies. Interact with it. Uh, right? Uh, Interact with it. Africans, gracious net, Africans don't have any business doing feminine coalition. It will just turn you to something else. It's uh, alien. Am I saying women are not abused in Nigeria? Women are abused everywhere. Men uh, are abused everywhere. Only that African men ego won't tell you the, the wife is abusing him. <laughs> <laughs> You see, we should stop acting scripts that we don't know the director or oh. the script writer. We are acting scripts that we don't know who wrote it. Look at the NSAS. I deliberately stop using NSAS as a hashtag because the NSAS has become like the most beautiful girl on campus that every boy wants to date. Oh. Yeah. Everybody has come with their own agenda and just use it. You won't hear me do any hashtag on bring back our girls. No way. Uh, because I live in the North. I know the story of bring back our girls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> People use this sort of thing because we, they crap the scripts abroad and they down, you know, they just dump it and we begin to act it out. Uh, these are, these are the realities. Wow. These are the realities that we need to confront. Uh, you know, we need to help the world so that by coming to the stage as Africans. Yep. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so much, so much to digest, so much to think through. Um, the common thing that I'm picking from um, your thoughts and your wisdom is as we seek solutions, we, th we need to think not just about the world but we need to it's like going it's like going to study abroad you go to study whatever you go to study abroad and you take that wisdom 
and you want to come back home and apply the wisdom, you have to think in the context of your environment because everything you've learned might actually apply to where you're from because some of it might be in the context of that particular environment. And so you have to figure out, okay, what is going to work? And I remember actually having this conversation with um, with a, a pastor that is uh, someone I really respect. And he comes he, he comes for conferences here in the U.S. to learn. And, you know, and one of the things he, I remember we had this conversation like probably two years ago. And he said something that I really, I was like, wow, I wish everybody would think like you. It's like, you know, everything I learned here, which is what he told me, it's like everything I learned here, I actually cannot teach everything to my congregation because the context is so different. It's Absolutely. like I have to figure I have to figure out what is American and what is kingdom. And then I have to yeah. f- figure out what is even what is kingdom. How do I teach in teach in a context that the people I am leading will actually understand what I'm trying to teach them? Because if I just bring everything I learn and I dump it on them, it's they won't understand or they might go the wrong way or you might just yeah. yeah. Um, take the and I feel like that's something that Dr. Dot is, is is trying to help us think through, whether it's feminism, gender values, all, all the things that are important that we need to talk about. We need to figure out how do we do them as Africans, not just ad, um, copy and paste, but yeah, actually absolutely. A- adapt our education, our values, our culture into the things we are learning so that we can be true to who we are, true to our identity. And I think that is actually very true. And, yeah. um, Wow, so so many uh, so many things. I think um, closing thoughts, closing okay. thoughts, Doctor Dot. Um, I, I want you to speak t- specifically to African millennials now, and maybe Gen Zs, who are the upcoming leaders. And if if NSAS has taught us anything, the NSAS protests in Nigeria, it's like a generation is clamoring for. We want something different than what we, we might not know exactly Absolutely. what different is, but we see that what's going on right now is not working. We want something different. Well, what would my be closing your, thought. Yeah. your closing thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. My closing thought would be, first of all, one of excitement that mm-hmm. over the years I've spoken about Nigerians need to learn how to protest and mm-hmm. that the protest happened. Maybe you, you don't know how excited I am mm-hmm. that finally. Nigerians can hit the road, mm. right? And we, it was, it was, it was clear that this was this this was done by good thinking. They will, they will go protest. They will clean the streets. They do it. They provide food for themselves. They do all those kind of things. And and that's why it's so clear when the establishment came and just tried to sort of, you know, put another color on it. So that protest. Is a very good beginning. Now, sustainability mm. must be strategic. And I need to emphasize that point. Activism is different from leadership. We are starting, millennials are now starting to learn how to practice engaging activism. They need to look further ahead to prepare themselves for leadership. There's something I've been warning against, and I'm going to say it in this global space. If they are naive enough to say they want to go and start a political party, they prolong the journey. Why? They will never win. They will never win. <laughs> because they, start, they, they, they need to appreciate the challenge that's ahead of them. If they sign a political party, that means they are naive enough to think that elections happen here. We don't vote in Africa. Do you know me that elections, democracy election has killed has killed more Africans than malaria? Wow. Yeah. Huh. Electoral process, democratic process has killed more Africans than malaria. Huh. There's no election here. What is my advice is to learn, you know, is to learn leadership. And when you're going to learn something, someone was telling me that I'm a Christian, I don't, I can't do, you know, Halloween. I said, why? He said, because of the devil. I said, wow, is it of the devil? He said, yes. I said, Zana, no, you didn't know the devil? Don't you think as a Christian, you need to know the devil? <laughs> 
come on, get into get into it and go and practice it, and then you know the devil. Because if you don't know what's bad, how do you avoid it? Mm. You see, these are the kind of things they need to engage. If you're going to learn leadership, you need to learn how to do it right, how to do it badly. Mm. They need to understand the place of mentoring, apprenticeship. I'm saying this because, you see, I shouldn't be saying this publicly, but I'll say it publicly because the, the establishment are so blinded by power that they won't even know when the millennials come to come and learn from them so that they can take over. So that it can, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not next, it's not power must change hands. That's not the mantra. That's mm -hmm. not transformation. Millennials need to know that most of these guys are their uncles, they're their parents. You have some of their values. If mm -hmm. many of these millennials get into power today, they will do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They will do the same thing. They will do the same thing. They will still buy those cars. They will, they will, you know, drive on the road with siren, chase people out, and all those things. They will do the same thing. They need to know that we want to transform. Not power must change hands, and mm -hmm. they need to learn leadership. And if there is going to be an end game for Nigeria in particular, if there's going to be an end game. This country, we must. They must put their feet on the ground. That this country must be restructured. Mm. My 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 prescription for Nigeria has always been United Tribes of Nigeria. Mm. Let the tribes, you know, have their own kind of and and, you know, that's so critical because we won't head anywhere. Mm. We can develop with this structure, and the millennials must pioneer it. They need to look at themselves. That first of all, let me. I, I must accept that I have a tribe, but I must not be a tribalist. Uh. Yeah, I must not be a tribalist because there's a difference between being, being having a race, being racial, and being a racist. Uh. So these are these are the things that we have to you know that we have to understand. And finally, if if if, if there are no other questions, they need to appreciate small. Most of these millennials want to go into politics. Let's widen the definition of politics. Politics is not limited to seeking electoral posts. Uh, right? Uh, and if they want to go into politics to, to engage in public service, value small. Many of them want to start their political career by going for presidency. There's uh, a young lady in my, you know, you know, in our organization. He couldn't lead a women's group. He put out a poster for president. You can't lead a women group of 70 people. You want to be president of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Many of them believe that the only way I can make a difference, number one, is to go into politics, seek elected posts, and then become president. That's it. That's that's a banana peel. Uh. They brought out a law, not too young, not too young to run. To, to run, yeah. They asked me, and I said, that's a banana peel. What happens when you turn 18? They say you can vote. Right, uh. and you can be voted for. So why do you need another law telling you that you are not too young to run? It's it's a, it's diversionary. Uh. We need political education. We need to understand. You know, politics is not election. Politics is the arrangement of human life for flourishing, for uh. commonwealth. Right. So uh. these are the things that I want leadership is is so is so you know is very very important they need to go on economic education social education you know political education they need to and that's what my center is committed to i'm mm. i'm doing that from high school mm. wow yeah i teach the class monitor that it's your duty to clean the class mm. that's why you are a class monitor you clean the class. Not that you ask people to come and clean it, but you mm. clean it, but because the place is big, you now ask people to come and help you. Mm. That's how to be a leader. You see, that's how okay. it starts. That's how it starts, because we've never had anyone serve Nigeria. They've only ruled Nigeria. Mm. Yeah, that's the, those are the narratives we need to change. So, dead lot, but we, we can nibble on it, nibble on it, we need to appreciate small. Do you know that the 
the the economy of a tier of local government in Lagos State is as big as the economy of Kenya. Wow. So the local government chairman of Ethiopia is like a president of another African nation. Wow. So these are the things that 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 we we you know we need to understand. We 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 need to appreciate our differences, right? And not mm. set them aside. We are different doesn't mean we, we can't work together. Mm. But we are different. Mm. We need to respect culture. We must be tribal but we're not be tribalists even god is biased mm. for truth is mm. biased on the side of truth so don't say don't be biased no 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 even god is biased on the side of truth mm. he won't do anything if it's not truth is biased mm. you know so these are the things honestly we can go on and on and on and on and on and on, mm-hmm. and on but 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 we need to look at those areas that are education religion you know those kind of things those are the basic hallmarks mm. and then family family mm. how we raise our kids how yeah. we raise our kids thank you very much me honestly so good. Really thanks excited. so good dr dot yeah. wow so many so many so many good 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 words and wisdom shared today looking through your comments thank you guys for leaving such amazing comments it's a powerful incredible um, I love this. This was a prayer from my cousin. Just prayer, God help us. So suitable and appropriate leadership for African nations. Yeah, that is true. We have a leadership problem. And just like Dr. Doss said, we need to start from the ground up, not from the top to the yeah. bottom, but actually Absolutely. from the grassroots is where we need to start from. And I love this comment by Darling, which is very true, um, which Dr. Dodds talked about in in the beginning about um religion and christianity figuring out what kind of christianity are we practicing right now are we practicing what we've been taught or have we gone to actually figure out what is the bible or what is what was jesus actually trying to establish and yeah. take those cultures and apply them to our own context we still want this. to be white as snow <laughs> we don't have snow in africa <laughs> <laughs> oh man Oh God. And then uh, I love this United Tribes of Nigeria without being tribalistic or having tribal biases. Very, very true. Very true. A cultural transformation approach is therefore required. That is very true. Um, how does this affect our culture? Yep. That is good. People have to make a decision to change. And you know, millennials. Um, this is a challenge to us. This is time for us to actually think through going all the way back to the beginning. It's a slow journey, but we can get there. But we need to start from the grassroots. And the press, I don't, I mean, if anything, if I've learned anything from living here in the US, is that the president doesn't really have the power to make change. It's probably, I mean, it's the biggest office um, in the world, the biggest position in the world, but that is not actually the most powerful person um, in the country. The grassroots is actually the most powerful person in the country. And if we start from the bottom, educating our children, educating people on right values and, and our culture, going back to the things in our culture that actually represent who we are, the, the beauty of who we are as Africans, and we bring that back to the forefront and teach our children those beautiful, the culture of hard work, the culture of honor, the culture of um, respect, the culture of language and tradition and celebration and so many things that make us africans if we learn all that i truly believe that we can make a change and we can yeah, transform you, our cousin continent. said it's not a your cousin said it's not a millennial so <laughs> yeah all that millennial what's your problem <laughs> yeah all that millennial um anyway uh, I want to thank everybody who has joined us live. I want to thank Dr. Dodd. Thank you so much for this time. I know we could go on forever. There's so many things we didn't even touch. But for the sake of time, we're going to stop here. And if you're watching, hey, remember to click the like button. Remember to subscribe to our channel. Leave a comment. Let me know where you're watching from. And I will see you in the next live stream. Peace.